So when they said to me, would like you to do a panel on slots, the first thought was, well, that's riveting. Um, but having covered slots in some shape or form for years, it's always one of those things that everybody knows something needs to be done. The only question is what? And at the moment you try and change it, then it all goes horribly wrong because there can't be an agreement. With us is Pierre Schmidt of Vinci Airport. How many airports have you got? 52. 52. How many of them are slot constrained? About a dozen. Uh, level 3, yeah. The bigger one being Gatwick, yeah. Lisbon in Portugal, and then uh, we have others that are but less congested but also coordinated level 3. So Gatwick, Lisbon, and, 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 uh, and then... And then we have airports in Japan and then Chile for the, the ones that are heavily constrained, Brazil as well. Uh, and then we are in the US, the right. Republic, Europe. And Ricky Christensen of Virgin Atlantic, you're responsible for what? I'm responsible for our network and our alliances partnership, including our flying program and slots. Uh, and then I'm also uh, chairwoman for the uh, IATA Slot Policy Working Group. So you know about slots? I know a bit about slots. How many, you've got a lot of slots, haven't you? <laughs> yes. At Heathrow. Yes, we do. Um, all right, so we've known that slots need to be reformed for some years, correct? Mm -hmm. But the pandemic created, an, uh, if you like, a lever, an opening and an opportunity. What happened to your slots during the pandemic? Well, luckily, we got full flexibility, and that was really needed. Um, at the end, airline allocate and use their slots based on demand, and because of restrictions, we hardly could fly anywhere. Now, when we got that flexibility, it gave us an opportunity to reset. So from Virgin Atlantic, we are long haul carry only. And as you remember, in the beginning of the pandemic, it was really primarily domestic. We still, still saw some demand. We didn't have that. So for us, it was, we really had to reset. We had three months with no passenger flying. We reset to very much focus on cargo. Cargo has been a, a lifeline. Um, and our entire Heathrow, you know, bank structure was really moving from cargo. Uh, that was the key focus. So we created a new bank structure and the slot flexibility allowed that. Uh, so it gave us opportunity to be agile. Now, when you, say, uh, when you say it gave the flexibility, the first thing that had to happen, of course, was that the 80-20 rule had to be uh, waived because nobody was flying. So essentially, you had to waive it. But what do you mean by it gave you flexibility? So suddenly you could a slot is, you know, you get a certain... Did I say 13 or 5? Oh, your microphone's got a bit funny. It's okay. Hello? It's okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you get a certain time where you need to arrive and depart. Now, when your network is not the same anymore, and you constantly need to be agile, adjusting it to where you can fly. That's how it, that's how it was doing. Yes, can we have some hand mics, please? Just to get, for some reason, the... the, uh, the our friends. Let's see. Is it While we uh, sort yours uh, out, let's make sure. Is it working, working. now? Um, okay. So, in terms of what your experience was during flexibility when the waiver happened, what happened? So, we saw initially that clearly the demand was not there, and the, the airline were a, a bit crossed by the fact that if they were um, not flying, they potentially would lose their historics, which, after all the the, the, the uh, commercial that they built on each of those routes, it would, it would be, of course, a waste. So we, we supported the fact that there would be some sort of flexibility given to the, to the airlines at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, no one would be happy to see uh, airlines forced to flown or encouraged to flown empty. Now, uh, as the demand resumed, of course, we needed to restore normal uh, course of business and restore the 80-20 rule to ensure that there would be a good, a good discipline in the usage of our capacity. We are providing capacity, we invested a lot, we have a lot of debt raised on that capacity, and that capacity needs to be flown. And as soon as demand resumes, uh, there is no reason why the airlines should not fly. Uh, they have agility and flexibility on the choice of routes that they serve, that's, that's great, and I think they have demonstrated a, a, a lot of agility during the pandemic uh, in addressing new markets, testing new routes, right. and it's in cargo, but it needs to be flown. Okay, but fundamentally, do you believe that the slot regime needs to be changed? Yes. Fundamentally, do you believe the slot regime needs to be changed? No. No. Right, there we go, thank you. Um, <laughs> what is it that you don't like 
about the current regime? So there are two things. First, uh, there is a capacity issue, uh, the waste of capacity. We are infrastructure providers, airports. We provide infrastructure. And if that capacity is not used in full, that's a waste. It's, it's, it's even adverse to the, the responsibility we have towards sustainability. And the second issue is competition. We believe that the current system prevents competition and is a, a strong um, and barrier of entry for new entrants or other airlines. So an airport issue, an airline issue. Okay, the, the capacity question. Why is there a capacity issue when the runway is being used? All the slots are being used. Precisely, that's, that's something that is a flaw, that it's perceived as being used, but there is some airlines that are playing a little bit with the rules and are actually just monitoring their slot usage at the threshold you mentioned, the 80%, but are still not using the 20 other percent, and use that, that buffer that is usually done for operation needs as a tactical mean to avoid returning slots right. to the so, pool so, and to so, prevent so from what, other airlines to, gig, to so get in. So what you're saying is they are slot squatting. Yes, uh, let me give you an example. You, you book a table at a restaurant and you don't show up, then the restaurant, the, the, the restaurant owner would have cared for the table, the waiters, the food, and you don't show up. That's what happens with us. We provide infrastructure for, let's say, 100 movements, and potentially an airline use only 80 movements and pays only for 80, and we're supposed to be happy, uh, well, and on top of that, we're supposed also to reduce our charges. It's not going to work. So you, you, you want us to provide capacity. Uh, you want us to lower our charges. We need traffic for that. I, I even hear some airlines yes, earlier, um, yesterday, I think, mentioning capacity discipline. So we, we're a bit confused exactly what's, what's going to happen. But it's a capacity matter. We're happy to deploy capital to improve the capacity, right. but it needs to be used. Right. So the, the dreaded ghost flight, which you may or may I mean, you don't do as such. I mean, you, I'm sure you have done. Everybody's done it at some point. Uh, this idea that you are going to slot squat until you can better use it. Yeah, so I disagree. We have to remember the reason there is an 80-20 is to, for the seasonality there is in demand. At the end, airlines allocate capacity where there is demand. Every route has seasonality. There is high season, low season. That is the reason you have a lower threshold and operational resilience. And now, as an airport point of view, you look at it from your airport. But we have to remember that as a home-based carrier, let's take Virgin Atlantic at Heathrow, JFK, not a strong demand in January, as there is in August. We reduce a bit of JFK, but we add other markets instead. What are we going to do in JFK? That's not our home market. We need to think about the threshold is set for, we have a both end of the route. As a home market carrier, you can use the same slot for multiple destination, and therefore your seasonality is much lower. But what at the other end? If we are set for a threshold that is so high, we can't do that, and then you get ghost flights. So how difficult is it, once you've got the slot at Heathrow, at say 1500 mm -hmm. or whatever, how difficult is it to coordinate that that slot is, that your departure slot at Heathrow is going to coordinate with an arrival slot at the airport you want to fly into? So that, that's why I said we don't need a new system and why the current system works. We can talk about the modification we need to do, but remember our schedules is coming from a network strategy. A network strategy we put into a schedule that connect with connectivity, global connectivity, consistency, and you get grandfathered your slots that provide your customers at the end the certainty that you can deliver that schedule and connectivity. So when you plan, we plan, of course, our program. It's not new every season. There's a lot of history right. where you do on this. Why do you care, other than, I suppose it's a revenue issue in terms of passenger and number of the, the, the passenger fees that you, you receive. But besides that, why do you care what the airline does with the slot once it's been given it? Well, why is it any of your business? It is a bit of our business, not just our business. But of course, it is not the same in terms of operations, whether it's long haul, wide body, narrow body. So all that we need to understand in terms of, of planning. But yes, ultimately, it's a strategic choice by the carrier, and we have no saying with that. We can provide incentives to certain routes where we believe it would be an addition to the territory we serve. Don't forget that in some cases, we're 
also a gateway for territory, and we have mandates by the public bodies to try to open new territory. So, uh, but otherwise, no, you're right, we, we don't really care. What we care is that we, we're building infrastructure, we're being asked to add capacity, uh, and for, for that, we're, we're happy to deploy capital to build it, but then it, is, it needs to be flown, and, and it's not just, uh, if we just build it for peaks and we have off-peak capacity that is not, not being used, that's, that's not efficient. Even from a sustainability point of view, it's a, it's a waste. So that's something we need to figure out. And I think the, 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 the current system doesn't allow enough dynamic allocation of the slots to allow new entrants to get in. These, some of these big airports are fortresses. So let's talk about the new entrance rule. Um, let, 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 let's look at that. There is a certain truth in it. Look, I know you can buy the slot, and they're very expensive. Not everywhere. All right. But I remember very clearly when, I think it was Continental, started flying into Heathrow as a result of open skies, and they paid an offensive amount for their first set of five, six or eight slots. But within two years, they had 15 or 20, or 20, 20 sorry, they've got to be equal numbers, 16 to, to 30, because slots become available, don't they? So slots at the constrained airport, and let's just be clear, you can't buy slots most places. It's actually primarily a UK thing. Now, in UK, Heathrow is constrained. It's super constrained. It's our home. And of course, if you want to secure future growth, then you can buy yourself into that access. Heathrow is, you know, at, if we look pre-pandemic, you can utilize 99% of your slots. 98% was used. So I actually disagree with saying that the current system doesn't work. There's a slot return deadline where you can hand back slots that you're not intend to use. Oh, those nobody's periods. ever going to hand back a slot. Well, you're not Have you hand ever handed back a slot? Not the full period, but the period you're not using, the off-peak you're talking about. That, that is, and that's why Heathrow ended up with 98% slot utilization. Just to be clear, <coughs> for those who are not as familiar, the slot is not just the right to take off and land. It's a timed slot. It comes with, a, with an actual timing slot, yeah. Right. You can, you can swap them if you have a portfolio. You can swap with potentially other airlines. But it's not route-specific. It's not, not cargo. Could, could, be, could be in the slot allocation process. A slot a coordinator can be, give it a route-specific for a certain number of seasons initially. But it changes. Over time, you get, you get historics, and you can swap it to other routes, yeah. So can I add to that? A slot is if it's a passenger flight. If it's a... Uh, cargo flight, that is separated. It's also based on terminal aircraft types. There is a lot of details in the slot. So when we're talking about a new system, it, it's simply not, it's overseeing how complex into the details this is. And I'll give you an example. In the US, you're not runway constrained. There's plenty of runway. There's much more constrained in terms of terminal and gates. In Europe, we are less constrained on terminal and gates. We are runway constrained. So. I mean, so that's why it's much more details into the slots than we just think. What would be your preference instead? Uh, aside of the slot, so the ideal system for us would be primary auctioning. So we would, would be, be what, sorry? Uh, slot, slot charging. We would be charging for slots. So you want to fly at, at 3 p.m., you'd pay that 3 p.m. price. Of course, it's a bit provocation, and, and I don't think the airlines are, are ready for that. So you want a bidding war? Could call, it, call it bidding or just say market-based practice. Uh, you have better commercial revenue at a certain hour, then you pay for it. And if it's off-peak, then you don't pay for it. So that's not, that's not the mechanism market-based. And how long would you get it for? You get it for, for, you know, for two, uh, once you've... So that's, that's the, the issue with this system is, is, is the history. So we, want, we, we agree with the airlines that they need to have historics. The grandfathering rights is, is an element we agree on because it provides stability. So that the, the inconvenience with, uh, with uh, slot charging is you don't, it's not easy to build historics. So putting aside that slot charging mechanism, the other mechanism that we'd like to see is that there is some sort of incentive to use all the slots you have. So whether it is penalty-based system where you don't use the slots, or whether there is an additional incentive if you reach the 100% usage, that sort of mechanism, market-based, uh, with the financial trade-off, would, would, would work, we believe. There's a certain logic to this. I is mean, it? well, let's face it, last time I checked, your seats were more expensive on more popular flights, correct? Of course, it's demand and supply. Uh, so but why is it demand and supply 
on the aircraft, but a regulatory system on the ground for using the takeoff and landing. Both are scarce resources. What's the difference? So there is, first of all, already airport charters in place. So then we can talk about if we go into a pricing mechanism, do you really then get the new entrance? Do you get really where demand is? And at the end, as an airport's infrastructure that you're providing to where the consumer want to go, do you then provide that you ensure that we get flying to where there's most highest demand? Or is it just in based on a pricing? But you don't object to the, Heath, to the UK game where you have a secondary market where you actually a v only the very rich airline can access uh, fortresses like Heath or Gatwick. So you object to the mechanism for the basic entrance to an airport, but you don't object to it as a, as a secondary between airlines. So this but is your solution, the your sol solution to have a slot charging would, mean, would be even worse for new entrants because you'd end up with a Qatar or an Emirates no, no. being able to buy no, exactly is, the slot they want on a daily basis, as many as they want. Well, as long as they can make money out of it. So a new entrant could at least access to off-peak, could access to some part of the day where there is a bit less demand. Uh, so, no, no, it's, it, it works as well. But again, it's pure slot charging, we park it a little bit, it's, it's a bit provocation. What we, what we want to explore is a very good incentive to have all the capacity used. Our frustration comes to when we have airlines that are just flying at the threshold and I not using all the I want to come back to this idea of capacity use because I'm not sure I fully understand your, your, your argument. If the airline is taking off with a plane that's full of passengers, that's capacity. Mm -hmm. So what's your problem? If the airline is taking off without any passengers, that's the airline's problem. Oh, we're fine with that. The, the, again, airline choice, we're fine with that. We're saying that some airlines in some airports are sitting on capacity they don't use. That's our problem. And when I hear airlines that are openly expressing the term of capacity discipline, at the same time, the same airlines or other airlines want to have right. more capital investment. They want to see us deploy capital. Slot the squatting. So, so they're running and, smaller planes. And they want to also, on top of that, have lower charges. I mean, it sounds right. like a bit Christmas but, early. But isn't that matching demand and supply? Well, not really. Not if you, if you have a limited supply of a scarce resource. You want it to be used in the most effective way. And if you have airlines basically ghost flighting, um, running smaller aircraft so that they don't have to do, you know, basically make, I, I think meeting the minimum requirements of the 80-20. So I think that's where there's probably a little bit of confusion. I mean, do we know how expensive fuel is right now? I mean, flying ghost flights. I mean, airlines don't want to do that. I mean, you, we're coming back to my example into that we are looking at into just like a restaurant. A restaurant is not a full capacity throughout the day. There's peak and, and, and low peak hours. The same goes for an airport. I mean, there will be period in a season where there is less demand and airlines are reducing. Also, we have to think about our sustainability targets here, that we are reducing it because we don't see the same demand. Personal experience from an airline point of view, I've worked in an airline in the past. It took that airline five years to get slots in Orly, uh, while all the time an uh, anonymous carrier flying out of Orly was sitting on a lot of slots. They, were, they weren't used, they were trading at 80%. What were they so doing to sit on the slots? They were, they were uh, flying to destinations, but they didn't have the capacity or they didn't have the, the interest, the market interest to fly all the slots. So they had just a portfolio that was not used fully. So if you were at the airport at the time, not mentioning the other new entrants that were lining up, there is frustration from the airport seeing that capacity not flown but and from the new entrants being at bay and not, not in the airport. Again, I come back to this point. I, I, I see where you're, what you're saying. But that's a value judgment of the airport. In the same way it's a value judgment of the airline, that's a value judgment of the airport that that slot is not being used in the most efficient way. Yeah, it has a lot of value for us. It is, of course it is, it is our value. Again, we deploy capital, we raise debt to provide that, and it's sometimes even asked by the airlines to, for us to, to, to add the, that capacity. So it's, it matters to us. I'm not saying that some airlines don't fly 100%. I recognize that it, 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 there right. are good airlines, of course, that what? are flying the capacity, but there is still capacity out there that we want to use. So, and this system right now, 
right. doesn't allow us to recapture that capacity and address it either to new entrants or, or even to the incumbents. Did the pandemic open the Pandora's box? Because until the pandemic, even the, the mere suggestion, I mean, there were, you, know, you were all arguing about this behind the scenes and the, the world at slot guidelines or whatever. So there was an argument going along, but it was a fairly sterile one that everybody had had for many years, and really nobody was going to actually do much about it. Now, you've had waivers, and you've reimposed, and then you're partially reimposed, and you're partially wavered, and now you... So, has a Pandora's box been opened? If it has, we need to close it immediately. Um, I think also, if we're looking at the current climate right now, that there is definitely, probably also they see that some kind of system needs to be in place. Um, we can take UK as an example. Uh, from having more slot flexibility to put one of the highest thresholds um, in the world. And you can see right now that actually the infrastructure can't handle it. So there is probably also something realism into that the system do work. Do we need to do some modification? Yes. Do you think a process has begun? I think it has, yes, put the spot on the topic of slots. Very clearly the pandemic had opened the sort of Pandora box, as you say. Uh, there, there were two outcomes. I think one, very clearly, we were forced to uh, change or to consider some evolution in the system. Uh, so policymakers are actually looking at it at the moment. And I think the other benefit I would see is that it has forced us, airports, airlines, slot coordinators, to, to, to work uh, uh, in a collaborative way. And it came right at the moment where we had started the, the World Airport Slot Board and, an, and a framework to work on all these topics together. And that has actually helped at the right timing to enhance our collaborative approach for, for these topics. So yes, in, in, a, in, a, in a bad way, it had opened the Pandora box. You can, you can say that, but it has also forced us to open our eyes to be a little more uh, attentive to the others. Um, so we have accepted the fact that, of course, we, we can't go for ghost flights. Uh, that's, that's unacceptable. I think the airlines have also understood well, well, that we have that capacity issues, and we have not got any public support financially. So, you know, it's a, it's, it was a crisis for everyone. Everyone needed right. to make an what, effort. What about the idea, that the idea of you get your slot for 10 years, and then it goes back in the pot afterwards? Yeah. You don't like that, do you? No, I definitely don't. I mean, no. Do you like that? No, I, I agree. It's not needed. We, well, you we, agree? Yeah, we, we, must have, we have. It must be a good idea, then. We, ha we have a couple uh, uh, topics on which we, we agree. Uh, the justify non-use of slots. When you have a territory that is totally locked and you can't fly to it, it would be unfair for an airline to lose historics when they literally cannot fly. So there are, there are common grounds on a few topics. Finally, do you expect change? Or is this one of these things where there will be a huge amount of noise, a lot of beating of chests, and <laughs> it's simply too bloody difficult. Put it back in the box. Uh, I think there, there will be changes. Uh, not in every country, but Brazil is already changing a few things in their uh, slot regulation. Europe is clearly on, on the... Uh, uh, Does there need to be a single rule for all countries? They, uh, it's, it's good that there's a consistency, I think, uh, for the reasons that Rick explained earlier. Now, it, there are specific rules to specific markets. I think there need to be some sort of uh, consistency inside Brazil, inside the US, inside Europe. But then, within those markets, you can have differences. I will be honest, I'm, I am actually, and I think the airlines are really worried uh, about the political right now with reviewing slot regulations. We need one consistent way of handling with slots. We need to be able to plan both ends of route. We need to have the same, I mean, this is what the entire fundament, to provide that certainty in your schedules, how your network strategy come into a schedule and you can deliver. And really, really nervous about this because it's much more complex. And I think airports and airlines recognize that the current system do work, but we do need to do some modifications to, to it. No, I don't think it does recognize that it works. I think on this note, we'll have to leave it, that you both agree, I sort of think, on certain things, like you don't want, you don't want an auction, well, not an auction, you don't want um, uh, time limits on slots, and you sort of both agree that universality would be, is preferable to a fragmented regime. 
to, to some yes. extent, local rules can, can be helpful, to be honest. But uh, you have to recognize that you were mentioning the US, is a, the, the gate right. system is a very different. So some systems are, are quite different, so you can accept different rules. A prediction. They exist. One global system. A prediction. Will there be a change in the next three years? Yes or no? Yes. Modifications. I'll take that as a yes, too. Ladies and gentlemen, slots. Anna.